Good evening. You're watching The Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. Tonight's program is about spying, spying on the internet. Not spying conducted by the government or by Google or Microsoft, but spying conducted by someone you probably know, a nosy neighbor, a competitor, some adversary, or perhaps even your spouse. And our question tonight is the following. Is spying on the internet, digital spying, has it become pervasive? And here to discuss this fascinating issue with us are Jacqueline Barnett, a New York matrimonial attorney, an expert in divorce law, who has used electronically obtained evidence in her practice, and Jack Devine. Jack Devine is a 32-year veteran of the CIA. He was chief of worldwide operations, and he is now co-founder and president of the Arkin Group, a firm of investigative consultants. Jack and Jackie, welcome. Now, Jackie, mm -hmm. you were interviewed by the New York Times in connection with an article about spying on the internet, mm -hmm. and you made the statement, no one cares more about the things you do than the person who used to be married to you. What do you mean by that? I meant the truth because the people that you loved are the people that will forever care. Because the opposite is indifference, and it's rare that they get indifferent. They want to know what you're doing, with whom you're doing it, when you're doing it, and how much it costs. Now, it starts, perhaps, with a spouse being suspicious uh, that his or her partner uh, is cheating. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean cheating, but that things have changed. In the same way that you don't have to take a baby's temperature to know something's wrong, you just see the baby's acting differently. If your spouse is doing things differently, whether it's losing weight, changing their time schedule, going to the gym, buying underwear, doing things that are out of the ordinary, that's the first warning sign that something may be up. So if you saw your spouse was buying underwear, why would that be a sign that he was perhaps having a roving eye? Because it's very rare that men will buy new underwear. That's true. In, in my 30 years of divorce practice, it is very rare. As long as the elastic works, it's good. So if my wife sees I'm buying new underwear, she better go consult you right away. Well, if she's watching this show, I'm sure she already will. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's probably right. Now, uh, is it true, as the New York Times article suggested, that uh, spouses are turning to spyware uh, in order to find out uh, what uh, their spouse is doing on uh, the Internet? Since reading the article, I've looked to see about it, but in my own practice, I found that there's so much that they can do that's just left there, that they didn't use the spyware. All you have to do is look at the family computer that's right in the living room, to look at the odometer on the family car, the PDA that someone leaves on the bed stand while they're in the shower. What's a PDA? A personal digital assistant, you know, your Blackberry or your Palm. There's tons of information and when people have certain patterns, whether they're cell phones, they suddenly have whispered short conversations, usually the first call and last call of the day is the person that they're in love with. Uh, and, uh, and you find that uh, there's that kind of evidence gathering that goes on in a marriage? I think when a marriage is on the end slide, people tend to look for clues and cues to see whether or not something is changing about the relationship and if they can do anything either to save it or to get the best possible position in case there's a divorce. Now, have you heard of uh, some spyware called Pandora that can be found on the Internet? Well, I've recently learned about it, but I've never known anyone personally that's used it, and I think it would be very dangerous for a matrimonial lawyer to encourage a client to use any such uh, programs because the laws are different in every state, and the laws are changing every day. And I think one of the problems will be that when someone is emotionally distraught, they could be tempted to cross the boundaries. So there's so much out there. Easy pass. It tells you what time someone went through the tunnel. And if they said they're at the office at 6 o'clock, but you see that they left the island at 520, you have enough evidence to start to follow things up. But to get Easy Pass uh, records, I'd have to know a username and password uh, to get access to it on online, isn't that right? Well, no, they do send the bill to your home. 
Oh, so and my wife if, would open my Easy Pass? No, bill? you don't open someone else's mail. But if you have a family account, sometimes the bill is in that person's name and they don't think about it because the reason they're doing the Easy Pass is so that they could save time. Unfortunately, what they're saving time for may be exactly what you're looking for. Now, Pandora's on the internet, and uh, Pandora uh, actually uh, advertises on the internet that you can use a credit mm -hmm. card and buy the software for $49, uh, and you get uh, an innocuous bill or an innocuous statement on your credit card that doesn't say Pandora, it says something like CLKBK. But a fundamental they're inviting surreptitious but surveillance. But a fundamental isn't that right? part of discovery is going through the credit card records of someone. So if somebody did order that through their credit card, you would have a paper trail and then you would find out what they had done. And I just don't think the mileage is worth it to use your credit card to buy that. Now, uh, Jack, uh, in, in your practice, have you uh, come across Pandora or something like that? I'm familiar with the whole range of them. In fact, as you said, you can look on the internet, Jim, and find multiple packages, software packages. And they look fairly innocuous. Most of them fly under the flag of monitoring your children's behavior. And I was looking at one in preparation for coming here today, and I found it quite interesting that not only could you monitor the computer at home, but if your student or child were off at the university, they have another package. And you can access his computer or her computer remotely. You'd send an email uh, with an attachment, and when the um, student opened the attachment, uh, then you would be able to read the email messages and the, the keystrokes of your, your child. Now, that's, and I'll defer to Jackie on this, but that probably falls within acceptable bounds as far as children is concerned. But the minute you move to a spouse, and again, I think the laws, as Jack said, are very diverse in various states. Uh, it's confusing, but I think the bottom line on it is I think you're breaking the law if you were to apply that against your spouse. And in my world, which is largely the commercial world and not the matrimonial world, it applies there equally in the sense that if you're concerned about someone in your company, you're concerned about um, a competitor, these techniques are in violation of, of the general sense of the law. And I, give Jackie some business here, before you go down that path, you better consult a lawyer. Because this is a very, very, very treacherous area with a lot of confusing uh, let's, uh, laws. But what's interesting, too, about his business also is that a lot of people think, well, if I'm doing something at work, that's going to be privileged. And at a certain point in a divorce, the CEO's secretary could be subpoenaed and deposed. So a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to get in terms of getting access to his immediate computer, you might be able to get by his close personal assistant. So that there are multiple ways that you could get at information that are proper and legal and will be introducible into court. Jack, let's look at the business context for a moment. Um, a company has its own uh, computer system and it gives an employee uh, a computer a desktop or a laptop and uh, the employee sends emails around the company or outside the company receives emails uh, and sometimes there's a warning that the employer reserves the right to uh, uh, review those emails uh, that's perfectly legal isn't it that's done quite a bit I mean if it's the company's computer they have the right to monitor those computers I think it's wise, and I recommend this to companies that have brought us in to add, and asked us to look at the, a, the security of their computers and also on occasions to monitor certain activities. But you need to have an email policy. You need to set a policy. You need to make sure that that's reviewed regularly so that the employees understand that uh, they can only do business on their computers, and if they wander in other areas, that's fair game for the employer. Well, there was a case recently, you probably saw it, involving Dr. Norman Scott and Beth Israel Hospital, where uh, Dr. Scott was eventually fired from the hospital, but while he was there, he was preparing a lawsuit against the hospital. And he was emailing his attorneys, Paul Weiss, back and forth. Uh, and the hospital, of course, had access to those email transmissions. 
uh, they, uh, a motion was brought in the Supreme Court to suppress uh, the uh, emails, and Judge Ramos just held they were discoverable because there was no expectation of privacy, even though he was communicating with his attorney and and what he thought was a confidential communication. Well, in the digital age, I mean, now with uh, emails, I think it has affected um, the legal business tremendously. I, I, so many people now hang themselves, if you will, to their emails. Um, I find it curious. I'm in uh, contact with many lawyers. If I communicate with them, I barely get a two-word two <laughs> or three-word response because they understand the vulnerabilities that emails can create, but it is just amazing, and I'm sure Jackie has a lot of experience, amazing what people put in emails, very sophisticated people running large corporations, and, and, and somehow they lose their balance, and what's written in, in emails can be extremely damaging both in the commercial arena and I'm sure in the matrimonial arena as well. And now, they think if they push delete, <laughs> yes. it's gone, and yeah. that's, that's such an untrue fact, plus what people do not understand is that you can't misunderstand the words then as well. So if somebody's asked about a conversation, you can recall it to the best of your ability. But an email, it's crisp, it's there, and it says the tone and exactly what happened and the time of day. So you get this whole dialogue, and it so often undermines someone's position. Even in custody cases, you find that. Because the paper trail of whether someone is truly cooperative or obstructionist can be shown by a simple email, will you pick up the child at 4.15? Out of the book of Job, would that mine enemy had written a book. But what about the related subject of bugging, of uh, electronic eavesdropping? Well, I think the rules are very clear. Again, it, it breaks down when you start talking about uh, spousal, uh, sp uh, your spouse. But um, the law is very clear. You cannot uh, wiretap anybody's phone. You can't uh, listen in, if you will, on the conversation. Unless, as in the case of the state of New York, you have one party consent. In other words, if you agree to allow me to tape your discussion with Jackie, then that would be okay. If you did that in California, that would be against the law. Both of you would have to agree to it. But under no circumstances can I, as an individual, tap the telephone without either of you knowing about it. So I think that part of it is is very clear. Um, on the uh, spousal issue... Well, uh, and then uh, logically, you couldn't uh, tap into my computer without uh, my permission either, could you? Well, I think my understanding is the laws are being written now. I mean, there's still a lot of confusion, and there's differences between the state of Florida and Ohio and how you interpret um, emails. But I think what we were describing air earlier with going into your system, uh, Jim, I think that's now starting to be generally recognized as almost wiretapping, whether you're the spouse or you're not the spouse. Uh, your spouse could go in, in some states, and look at your emails as long as she didn't have to go through a password. So it gets, uh, gets layered. So I don't think that we've made a complete um, uh, alignment between wiretapping, if you will, and email. I think they're closing, and I think eventually we're going to be there where it broadly applies to both. But in a divorce case, you can ask to have someone's hard drive cloned, and then they'll tease out the privileged emails between the client and the lawyer, but the rest of it is there. So I think you have to understand that if you play by the rules, then you'll be able to get in this kind of evidence if you need it. And one of the things that concerns me is Jack's very good point about different states. When people live in a place such as New York, so many people cross state lines on a regular basis. So you don't want them crossing other lines besides state lines because there are different rules in Pennsylvania and Connecticut and New Jersey. And all too often, someone just listens to their matrimonial or their criminal lawyer in their particular state, and they have to understand that the rules really change across the country. I think there's an assumption it's your phone, it's your house, it's, you know, that you can do whatever you want. And I think it's an eye-opener for people when they get into these uh, lawsuits that it isn't quite that way. Now, video is different. Uh, the, law seem, well, the law does allow video without sound in your, in your home. So your wife could put, and again, the spy shops around the city of New York will provide you just about everything under the sun, um, an opportunity to video. 
and that has not fallen into, again, the wiretapping um, uh, rules. So I could uh, install a video camera in my home, perhaps for a uh, legitimate purpose to see if burglars come in and uh, when I'm not there and, uh, and not try to identify I them. think it's even if you're just flat out trying to see if your spouse is having an affair, because I think the home is considered uh, the space is available to everybody and therefore privacy is not in, in, uh, anticipated. But I couldn't uh, install a bug in the house that would pick up the sound. The sound, when you go to sound, you then cross the line. So, okay, so sex, your, sex without noise. Okay, but what if your spouse was deaf and talked with sign language? Would that then be eavesdropping? I think that would be uh, uh, far-fetched. Okay, I'm just trying to <laughs> make sure. That, I, I would hope that'd be a case you would take. <laughs> but but, that's it. but, but uh, I, I, let's just extend that to uh, the workplace. Um, and I, I grant you, there may be many legitimate reasons for uh, bugging your own home. You might want to see if uh, your daughter is coming home with the wrong people after school. You might want to see if uh, your son is in, involved with drugs. Uh, now, with in the, the workplace, nanny. Or, the nanny. or with a nanny. Uh, but uh, what about the workplace? Uh, how does it work in the workplace? If, suppose you have a CEO who uh, suspects that uh, the executive vice president is planning a, a boardroom coup. Uh, can he bug the office of, uh, of the executive vice president? Again, I think on the wire, you're now in the wiretapping. And um, I don't mean the phone. I mean just a, a microphone to wire in the, the office. To yeah, wire, wire the office. It's a good question. We have not had. I haven't had it come up, but I would think that in the state of New York, I defer to you, mm -hmm. both of you, in that matter. But. I would think in the state of New York you probably could do that because you have one party consent. If it was just you and that one person in the room, you could uh, record that. Just like you could record a conversation on the phone with me That's because it's a one party, one party consent, if you will. But isn't it true that there's so much information also available when you have those key cards that let people get in and out of these large corporate offices? And they have a record of who entered the floor at what time, where they were. And sometimes that in and of itself could be put together that why was that person on that floor at that time when they shouldn't have been there. So there's a lot of different ways that we have used computer techniques to make life easier, but they leave a paper trail that you just have to pick up the scent on. I think that's a very good point, yes. Jackie. There are a lot of investigative tools out there that have been traditional, been accepted mm -hmm. um, by and large. But t the technology is now so tempting for people. Mm -hmm. You just put the software in, and now you're reading your your wife's emails. You're reading your competitors. E it's just very tempting. And frankly, because it looks like it's being sold commercially, mm -hmm. people aren't making the distinction that it might be okay to do it with a juvenile. And no. quite a different thing to be doing it in a commercial setting. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an area where we need to. Um, our population is very sophisticated in the use of techniques but are not very sophisticated on the rules and regulations that you have to adhere to in, in that environment. The other thing which I'm sure Jackie has encountered is, you know, you have the GPS in your, your mm -hmm. car, you know, and it's a, a great, you know, it's a great, uh, a great system. But instead of the old gumshoe, if you will, running around following you for hours, you put the G GPS monitor on your car and you can sit at your computer and watch you travel all around town while you're shaking surveillance going off to your mm -hmm. five to seven, as you would say. Um, so I think there are a lot of mechanical, technical devices out there uh, that have changed the, the business. And the question is, not only do individuals not understand it, I'm afraid a lot of investigative groups, uh, because there are thousands of them in the state of New York, from mom and pop to very sophisticated companies that understand these rules quite well, they don't don't see lines there. They will do anything, and, and I mm -hmm. suspect Jackie has encountered that. But I what about a sting operation? Of course, the government takes its chances with a sting operation because it may be entrapment where the government induces someone to commit a crime. Uh, are sting operations used in the, in the private sector? I haven't run across it. I mean, I think a lot of work can go into a sting operation, but you, you need the support of a lot of people to make it work. In the private sector, you're really talking about small commitments of resources. You can't set up a front company, and it just, I think a lot of energy sometimes goes into things that aren't really worth a lot. And I just want to make another comment. You know, I spent most of my life, if you will, in 
the clandestine world. Cloak and dagger. Well, if you like. Yeah. But my, my point is, you know, you're so much better off. Because you're going to find out things you really don't want to know. It's more salacious than you care. <laughs> I mean, I think you should approach bugging, following with great caution. There are occasions when it really is applied. It can be applied and should be. I mean, I had a case where someone took off with intellectual property and traveled halfway around the world with it. Well, that's someone you really do need to go after and follow and monitor. But when you get into the family setting and you're talking about your employees and whether the one of the, the vice president is leaking something, you'll probably find out it's a CEO out on the golf course and that it, it isn't a leak from within the company. So I think I'm not as big of an advocate, if you will, of a broad range of applying these techniques. I think they have to be done very selectively, maturely, and with a adult supervision that, and so it relates to the law. And I think that's the bottom well, line. Well, Hewlett Packard, the CEO, was worried that somebody was leaking. Indeed, a member of the board was leaking. They hired private investigators who uh, used some illegal means to obtain information. Uh, Private investigator was convicted of a felony. The CEO was dismissed. The general counsel was dismissed. That's my point. This is you, dangerous you stuff. Get, you, you get lost in your way, and people get yeah. intrigued by it. There's something salacious about being able to look and see and follow and track, and you lose you lose your balance in in what you're doing, and you can put your company and create a much greater problem for your company than whether or not someone on the board is going. There's other ways of dealing with this. But Jackie basic, said. there's basic guidelines, I think, though, people have to do in work and at home that they can pay attention to that are very simple. If you look at the return address of envelopes, if suddenly you're getting mail from different locations or if suddenly all the bills in your home are being rerouted, those are clues that you need to pay attention to. You don't have to go to high-tech software, you just have to wake up. And in the same way I tell every client that's going to sign a joint tax return, don't just say, where do I sign? Read all the documents that are related to it, because right above your signature, it says subject to the penalties of perjury. So I think that there's a balance between being an investigatory snoop and being, you know, in a coma. I think you really have to pay attention. I think people should look at bank statements because if you see someone goes to the same ATM all of the time because it tells you which branch and suddenly you see a different ATM repeatedly that's frequently where the person is conducting other activities because you usually use the one near your office or your home. You mean adultery? Yes, because so you want to use cash so you don't have a credit card record to show it. So suddenly you, you see about the in Soho the ATM out there yeah. when everyone else uh, has been. Okay, so he uses the, the ATM, which is just next to a hotel. Mm -hmm. Then do you, uh, do you follow him around or do you... Uh, well, it uh, depends on the circumstances, but sometimes there's so much out there that suddenly the person is walking the dog at night and using the cell phone at the same time, or as soon as you walk in the room, they hang up the phone. I mean, there really are very clear clues so that are out there. So if your husband is walking the dog at night, that's a sign he might be having an affair? In my home, yes, uh, it your would home, be. Yes, that's yes that's it would be. Doesn't have a dog. <laughs> that would be the real clue. Right? That would be the real clue. <laughs> but I mean, surveillance. But I thought that was a sign of an ideal husband. I mean. Surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> surveillance is a very effective tool, but I don't think people realize that it's time intensive. Intensive. You need um, you need to throw a lot of money against mm -hmm. uh, a surveillance. But if you stay on it long enough, you'll find out what you, you want to know. And your spouse will find out that you spent that money, too. That's for sure. Right? <laughs> because I think, again, you're talking, uh, it's probably the largest expenditure. These software packages are about $100. The GPS is probably $100. Surveillance, you start to run into the thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying to, uh, to establish. But I so think a spouse could put a GPS in the family car and then uh, have a tracking. Of sit the, there on his computer and watch. You know, instead of following someone, you just wait until that car parks in, you know, what is clearly a, um, um, as Jackie had described, a place for a liaison, if you will. We just had one added a month ago, and I'm now going to rethink that GPS gadget <laughs> <laughs> that my husband well, put in the car. It, well, it gets him where he wants to go. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, 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 that, that is so. Now, what about sweeping and debugging? Are you doing that as well? It's a, a regular part of, you know, uh, business defense. Um, it is done, and it's done uh, regularly. I think there are a number of businesses that are very and rightfully consulted about 
concerned about competitive intelligence. There's something we haven't discussed, which, you know, a lot of foreign governments are interested in our commercial activities. I mean, the Chinese have 3,000 front groups. The French, you know, at one point I remember taking great pride, the, the deputy chief of the service saying that they broke into 20 uh, hotel rooms a day uh, looking for information, uh, commercial information about the United States. So there's a lot of very sophisticated businessmen now that want their offices where they're conducting business to be swept because they're looking not only for competitors, but they're also looking for um, uh, foreign elements that have put an emphasis on economic intelligence. So there is a there is a real world out there that requires defensive uh, techniques. And have you encountered situations in your practice where foreign governments were uh, active in uh, using the internet or using electronic devices? Most of my adult life was devoted to finding, dealing with it, but in the private in the sector, private sector you know. I have not found uh, uh, cases largely because we haven't been brought into those. We've basically swept the established whether something is or is not penetrated. Um, and even there, the, the hit records, I think it's a question to give you, to give you comfort. Um, but the, the other thing is you look at your phones. But if it's a government looking at you, no matter what technique you look at, as far as the phone is concerned, a government can take it off the main switch and you'll never know your phone's being tapped. So you can only get into a, a certain level of of security, if you will. Yes. Well, now I have a question for you. Jack Devine has uh, spying become pandemic on the internet. I don't think spying has become pa a pandemic. I, I think what we have today is a generation of people that understand technology, and they're now starting to bring it to their private life. I do think there's legitimate concern about parents and their children, and is the nanny behaving properly, and I think that's a smart thing to do. I don't think I would put any device on my children, adult children's um, equipment. Uh, I don't think it's as common, uh, it's sensational when it happens. Um, I do think in the private investigative world, it's growing in the sense that you're using these techniques and maybe irresponsibly, but I don't think you know, Americans in general, if we were to do a poll, that we would find that anything above a very small percentage of engaging in, in spying. Okay. In the commercial world, and I'll just finish on yeah. that, on the, in the commercial world, as opposed to individuals, I think uh, through globalization, I think there's a much greater sensitization of businesses about understanding their competitors, and I think you're seeing a, a spike in what I would call competitive intelligence. And Jackie Barnett, we have to wrap up, but uh, has spying become pervasive on the internet? I think watching one's spouse has always been active, and it's just got new forms in which it can be done. So your advice is watch your spouse. A and watch your own back. And watch your own, <laughs> and watch your own back. Well, Jack Devine, thank you for always coming Jim, by. pleasure. Jackie a Barnett, joy. always a joy. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age, for the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.